virtual backpack trails through Kruger, which is what I've been doing. And so I've tried to put something like that together. And uh, so let's see, right, uh, how we go. So, so John Muir is one of the guys that really inspires me. And uh, there's another famous uh, one of these sayings that I always tell guests on the walk is that uh, everything is connected to everything else. And I've added my own little bit at the end, even if you can't see it. So if it, and what we've learned over the years doing this is a lot of the times, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you take out a little thing out of the system, it does affect the entire system. So the essence of these activities that we do, guys, is to take people into wilderness and um, to, uh, you know, to ex make people experience what it's like to be out there where there are no other humans, there are no other vehicles, there's no infrastructure. And if you think about it, uh, there's very little places left where you can actually experience that. So, you know, we've got the jewel in our country, the Kruger, which offers these. And, uh, and of course, to be a guide, freelance guide for the park is a real privilege. <clears throat> so, so typically what we do is, um, also, the Kruger offers a couple of activities, the Olifants River Backpack Trail, the Lonely Bull Backpack Trail, the Pongol, which I think some of the guys have done. Andrew's done it. Hey. Uh, okay. And uh, <coughs> hey, I'll do that. What about better? Eh? <coughs> cool. Yeah, so, so um, and then those three products, uh, well, two of them are the same, the Lonely Bull and the, uh, the Pongo. Where it's three nights, four days, and there's no real set route where you can walk. Uh, we get dropped off, we walk in areas with permission from the rangers, and off we go. We can either camp one night at one spot, two nights at one spot, uh, sometimes really three nights at one spot, but the idea is to set up your site and off you go, so that you can explore the areas without a heavy pack. Whereas the Olifants Backpack Trail is a, um, is a linear route, it's 47 kilometers. It's got a start point near the Palaboa Gate on the Olifants River, and it end up in an easterly direction, close to Olifants Camp. So that's walk, pitch camp, next morning breakdown, walk, pitch camp, and so it goes. And then of course, the newest one that got added through the only ranges is the, the Kruger Trail, which I know Chris is very interested in. Of course, these are big five activities. So your dangerous animals like your big five, uh, hippo, hyena, crocodile, there's a lot of stuff that's out there. So with, with two guides and a maximum of eight guests and off we go. Um, just out of interest, we don't walk with uh, loaded weapons. Um, we've got the rounds are in the chamber, but nothing's in the barrel. So a lot of these activities, um, it depends on the, the uh, you know, which product we're walking. Um, this particular picture was on the, on the, uh, the Olifants River. And uh, you can see. So one of the things I quickly want to talk about is the backpacks. Um, you know, these activities are self-sustaining. Self so you've got to carry your own water, your own food. Um, you've got to carry your own tents. So it's... Uh, it's interesting to see what guys bring on trail. Eh? I met a group of a guy who walked, he had no food, he brought three bottles of brandy <laughs> and he said one for each night. So I guess the next day, the next few days, they had no brandy because they drank everything up the first night we had to get them up the next morning. But yeah, um, so, so a lot of the times we walk, uh, it's pure wilderness. Uh, yes. Um, so, on the, so part of what gets provided is the two guides, the rifles, and a satellite phone that gets provided by St. Parks, first aid, um, and the rest you bring yourself. Yes. Yeah. Sleeping bags, everything. Yeah. Yeah, fully. So this is a true wilderness experience, and as I have to say, it's the best way to get this close to nature. I can't think of any other way. Um, and I mean, uh, later on, I'll talk about some of the experience at night around the tents and stuff. It's, it's pretty amazing. And of course, uh, what these activities also offer is an opportunity to get really close here. I'm just basically explaining a silver track to the guests and how it differs from maybe a curriculum which you can confuse it with or some of the other, you know, 
uh, bedded animals. Um, also, we this this draws a lot of attention. Also, is lion tracks, and uh, you can see to the left. Uh, this was on the Latabo River, and this male lion was there. Was actually two of them. They were drinking uh, water, and that's that's his um, his his back foot over the front foot. So we were sitting there and drinking water. And that night, uh, where we were camped, they were around the tents, hauling in the territory. It was really amazing. This was also uh, on a walk. Um, if I can tell you, we were probably about 10 meters from this guy and had no idea we were there. So a lot of the, the, the secret to some of these things is to, and you know, we inculcate this with the guests, is that this is not, a, it's not an experience where we compromise our lives or the guest lives, or for that matter, animals' lives. So we can get to pretty close, but that's not the idea with these activities. It's just to observe them in the natural habitat and to leave without even being detected. Uh, and so you need to know the trick with the wind and, 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 right? So that was, some of our campsites are really awesome. Um, this was on the Timbavati River, also taken the Kruger Trail. You can see um, this particular spot was also nice because the trick to doing these tra trails also is about how much water you carry. Um, if you're walking 20 kilometers a day, and as the guides, we know that we're not going to be walk finding any water, the guys need to carry at least four or five liters each. But of course, as part of the pre-trip planning, we know exactly where we're walking. We know where the water is. We in contact with the rangers to confirm if those are good camp spots, if there's water there. Any other guides that have walk walked there before recently, so all the information gets transferred so that we, we don't get ourselves uh, caught up in the situation. So yeah, we dug a nice hole on the side there and there's a lot of seepage at the bottom. Pure clean water, the Timavati is not polluted here. And I mean, we, had, you, we bath in these rivers, you drink from these rivers, so it's really awesome. <clears throat> this is just another one of our campsites. Uh, and you can see, uh, we like these shady spots. This is a nice big jackalberry tree. So here's an example of how we, we dig for water and we purify water. So a lot of what we do on these trails is um, go back to their roots, if I can call it. Uh, we do a lot of fire by friction, which, uh, which the guests love. We teach them how to do it. And we notice that usually <laughs> the first night, nobody wants to do it because they all look at you and they're like, this looks hard. You just need to do it once. And once they've got it right, it's like, they just want to do it all the time. So it's really awesome. And then this is when we dig for water. This was on the, remember where this is on the Pongo River somewhere. So what we usually look for is, uh, you know, elephants have the ability to smell water up to a meter, meter and a half beneath the surface. And all they do is they use their front foots, they dig holes and uh, not long and you'll see the moisture at the bottom. So we usually either use the same hole or we, 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 use a, we dig a hole next door because we know chances are. And all you do is make a nice little excavation. You show it up with some rocks to keep the silt back. And all you do is you just scoop out. And within a few moments, you've got crystal clear water. And I mean, we encourage guests to use water purification drops or those horrible tablets, which I don't use anymore. But uh, sometimes we just think straight from these rivers and it's, ah, it's just beautiful. It's pure, clean water. <clears throat> So, so, so look, I mean, that, that's a valid question because we're very careful. I mean, that decision we make is guides ourselves. I don't personally use drops in some of these locations, but, but the Olifants River, I don't take a chance. That river is quite polluted. It's, you know, any river that starts inside the park and ends inside the park is quite safe. There's mm -hmm. many of those that we walk on, but if it's got an entry out, outside and an exit outside, no, it doesn't work. I mean, I, I, made the, I paid that price once by... Uh, <laughs> Trying to be too clever, but yeah, you only need to make that mistake once in the olifants. Right. Ash, just before and, you go on, we can ask the guys yeah. in the room um, just to hang tight with their questions till the end, because we can't hear what they are saying and it breaks the, the flow of your chat. So let's just do all the questions at the end, if that's okay. Okay, cool. So, um, so this is on the olifant. So what happens is after a good day's walking, we get to our campsite, we pitch our tents and, um, it's time for a bath and uh, time to cook your dinner. So this is one of the spots where we had a swim in. 
And uh, you can see to the left there, uh, to be honest, I actually didn't notice that bird when I put the picture on and I remembered now when I, I think it was a fish eagle. And of course this river has got the pels fishing all also if, if you're into birding. Um, I'm so blessed with all the pel sightings. It's just unbelievable to see that bird on this river. Um, there used to be a lot more of them, but now due to the floods and some habitat destruction, there's very <coughs> few left out there. So this is uh, also in the evening, uh, the olifants, uh, I was actually sitting on a rock in the, in the river here, taking the shot and it's just unbelievable. Um, of course, it's a tough life in the bush, but someone's got to do it. And um, over the years, you know, we've also noticed with the guests, uh, they, they refine the, their gear and the way they go about doing their thing. And, you, you know, you, people who come on the, for the first time, part of what we need to do is we need to also contact the guests, even if they're overseas. Tell them, do you know what you're getting yourself into? Do you know what this activity is about? Have you got your own gear? Do you know where we get water from? Uh, so we just, and, and I always take extra stuff with when I go, not on the trail, in my vehicle. So that when we get there, I ask the question again, and often you see, people forget tents, people forget sleeping bags. So yeah, <laughs> but it's part of the fun. And that's my little Taj Mahal there in the back, uh, which I've pensioned off after 10 years of sleeping in that tent. I wouldn't say age is catching up, but I'm just looking for a little bit more comfort there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is another campsite. This was on the Lonely Bull Backpack Trail. Uh, along the Latava River, just to give you an idea, you know, um, we don't always camp at the same spots, but sometimes there are certain spots where you know that there's a lot of game. And of course, you know, the fire thing at night, it's just brilliant. Of course, this is the next morning when we get up and uh, if we're deciding to pack up our site and move along, we usually get up at the crack of dawn and um, But walking again, <clears throat> this is again on the Olifants River. So this particular group, um, the three, there were three quite elderly ladies and they really amazed me with their ability because their bags were each 25 kilograms and it remained 25 kilograms for all the days. I don't know how that's possible. <clears throat> but a lot of what they had was medication. <laughs> <laughs> But they were brilliant because I walked this trail with a little bit of tick bite fever and I was, I was quite messed up, but they took good care of me. And of course, the friendships that you make on these trails, like, I mean, you know, you guys, the SR Club, these friendships last, last for a lifetime. Eh? I mean, it's really, that's what I love about this is you can actually change people's lives. And, uh, you know, some of the, the points that we get to are just brilliant. You know, um, there's no roads there, there's no tourists there, there's nothing. It's just random copies brilliant views and fresh air is all of the day, you know. Um, and this is in the Pongol area, uh, which is up at Shinwetsi. It's one of my favorite apple, apple leaf trees, um, just the way this thing grows. I, when I walk in this area, I try and make a point of <laughs> just going by and saying hello. And the other interesting thing is um, these trails, uh, all of them actually, have you know, the park's quite old. I mean, Earth, Earth, planet Earth is old. People have been around. In this, you know, on this continuum of time, maybe we're somewhere at dot somewhere, I don't know, maybe towards the end. But if you look at what has happened up until the point where you're you standing at the spot, <clears throat> it's quite incredible when you find pot shards like this in Bushman paintings. And sometimes we even discover paintings that uh, nobody's even known about it, on a few, which, which is really awesome. In, uh, I know a little bit about the history and it's become a very interesting subject for me because people are actually interested in who's living there and what is these things about, which were the tribes. So these activities give you the opportunity to really play in the bush, if I can call it that. It's not like a day walk, you book at Skakuza and three hours quick in and out. Yeah, you can stop there. Eh? You can even have a chat about this. You can have a long discussion. And of course, I don't know, this is... <coughs> Uh, sometimes we uh, need to get rid of some stress. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, and then, you know, these, these activities are dangerous, guys. I mean, there's no two ways about it. We walk with rifles. And when I, 
when I chatted to Miriam about it, I saw that she actually mentioned that I've never used the rifle in the bush. I've chambered my rifle many, many times, um, as recently as last week at Marakele. But uh, I always say to the guests that the best way to learn the bush, guys, is to walk without a rifle, um, because then you walk with a different frame of mind. But that's when you're training. When you've got guests, you know, that is your. So we tell the guests, we give them a proper briefing in the start. Um, you have got dangerous animals, stay behind the rifles, listen to our instructions. Golden rule of the bush is don't run, guys. And of course, no YouTube moments, because it's the fourth one I've edited. We had some people compromising activities because of YouTube and social media going out of line. But a situation like this one that I've got here um, was taken from a vehicle. Because you might understand that when these things happen on foot, I'm not there with my iPhone. These things happen really quick. But the, the reason why I chose this picture is because it's not an uncommon occurrence on foot this way. The matriarch, and you can see behind it, towards the back there, she's got a little calf there. And uh, there's an older calf just behind her. So a lot of the times, if, if you don't know that, they say they are across on the other side of the ridge like what actually happened uh, a few times. And as the wind's blowing, you, you're sent towards them. <clears throat> By the time you see them, they've already picked you up. Now, as you might know, I mean, the matriarch, like any possessive mother, you know, protective mother, I should say, she, they, they usually react in a very uh, sort of, say hostile, but an intimidating way where they come at you. So when in, as part of the briefing, we tell the guests, guys, listen to our instructions. We've got the backup, the second rifle, you'll take care of the situation and I'll deal with this encounter. So the main thing with these things is these things do happen where they come at you and you've got to make a decision. So we've got usually zones as guides, you know, minds, we need to draw a line. If this thing crosses the line and if our lives are in danger, then you have to make that decision. Or you can make a quick decision, which is what I've done all the time, get people out of danger and then do what you do best is just try and stave off that enemy. She's just doing what comes naturally. So a key to this thing, guys, is uh, learning animal behavior. And you can predict a lot of these things, but there are times when, and my, my mentor in the park, Vanessa Stratum always tells me, there is that one day when they haven't read the book. They will do something that you least expect or you never predicted. So I always keep that insurance in there and I never take things for granted. So this, in the end, what they usually do is they just turn around and they run off. Um, this is a horrible picture, but when you do have a chance to snap a black rhino, <laughs> it's usually like this. And um, I've, had, I've had a few really serious encounters with black rhino. And, I mean, people call it the devil of the bush, the runaway steam train, but this is the animal that I respect a lot. This one, a hippo, a lone buffalo bull, a leopard. This animal, it's, it's such a brilliant animal in terms of the way it, it outwardly manifests its sense of who are you and what is there because they, they don't have a good eyesight. They've got brilliant hearing and the sense of smell is brilliant. Same with the white liner. So any poor sighted animal has got that natural tendency to react in a sort of a very physical kind of way. And I clearly remember this one, uh, Chris, if you're listening, <laughs> we were on a walk there and um, I was with my colleague and he, he was talking to the, rhino, the guests about the, I was a backup on that occasion. And I was, I remember being really tired eh? because after doing this a lot, some days you feel a little bit tired. Eh? But I was sort of an instinct, you rely a lot of instinct as your guide, you know, you, you listen. That's why you don't allow people to really talk while you're walking because talking takes away the listening as the guides. We talk when we stop. So we're quiet and I heard something from across the ridge on the other side and there was this magic gory bushes there. And I was like, something told me something's not right, but I couldn't see anything. So I just like carried on, like I was standing there, it's like, oh, it's hard today. <laughs> And I, in the next second, I just heard this like violent trembling of the earth. And I looked and I'm like, this black rhino came running straight for us. 
And that, so the guy got the guest behind this little bush and these rocks there. I'm like, gosh, and he picked up this rock and this black rhino came and as a rhino came, he threw the rock at the rhino, hit the side of the rhino on the flank here. And you know, they've got the filaria, the parasite that eats that skin on the black rhino. If you've ever seen, it looks like horrible wounds there. I just remember seeing that and my gosh, this is a black rhino. And as the rock hit the rhino, it turned and it ran into some rocks. They don't run over rocks, rhinos. They're not good runners over rocks. And he turned around and it started running straight towards me. And I'm like, yeesh, you know, <laughs> and you know, at that point in time, I said, I never wanted to do this, but today is the day. And uh, he was the backup was next to me. And I, I stood on those rocks. And I swear to you, that rhino was coming straight at me. The only thing I could say was, hey! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it stopped seven meters from me. And uh, I mean, that's like, right here. it was so huge. And um, it stood there in typical black rhino fashion, you know, <laughs> you know? and the head is up and the lips are up. And I was like, and I just stood there and I'm like, no, I'm not going to do anything. Eh? And it turned around and it ran off. Eh? You know, but, and I mean, it smashed a lot of trees and it was really cross. Eh? And uh, we looked at the guy and I said, hey, nice throw away. Eh? Came my way. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was the, and there were others like that. Eh, guys. So this animal, I mean, last weekend I was at Markele, just the day walk. We were tracking a white rhino. There's a lot of black rhino there. And what had happened is, a white, a black rhino had joined onto the same game path. Is. So you need to be able to pick up that all in a second, eh? Hey, it's because the tracks are different, you know? And even out here on these backpack trails, you need to be able to read the signs, the tracks. And then when I saw it's a black rhino, we aborted mission. So of course, this, yeah. Sorry, Ash, just a quick one before you talk, talk about this next slide. Um, yeah. When you're talking, if you can just as much as possible talk towards the computer because we're losing a bit of audio every now and again. Okay. All right, we'll do that. So, um, so a lot of the times when we encounter like lion, um, you know, people people ask the question like, you know, what do lions do when you encounter them? And it, it's it's a few things. It usually they run away. Most of the times they run away, but there are times when they won't run away. When they're injured, when, they, when they've got cubs, female, I've been drilled by a lioness a few times with cubs. When they're at the kill, and these old lions, it's not a particularly old lion, but um, sometimes they just in a bad mood, eh? and they come at you. You know, lion charges at 22 meters a second. And I mean, those zones that we talk about that we need to draw in our minds, you need to be, you need to draw those zones pretty quickly. Eh? And, uh, but you know, this occasion we just stood the ground in, um, yeah, it's, it's nerve wracking. Uh, the growl, when you, I could hear my ear, my heart pounding in my ears. It was really like, you know, all inspiring, but so much of respect for these animals because this is, and I tell the guests guys, we are to borrow from them. You know, this is their turf. Eh? So we tread with utmost respect and uh, we're not here to harm anything. And, and of course, this is a white rhino. Uh, which we've, we can have really cool close encounters with white rhino. Um, unfortunately, some of these uh, backpack trails, the, uh, you know, the rhino population have sort of depleted somewhat, but we do occasionally find the tracks. And I actually trust a black rhino more than a white rhino because I feel that a black rhino is more unpredictable and that's what I know. Whereas a white rhino comes across as being docile but it's usually very, very indecisive about what it wants to do, which is the problem. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just a quick one, you know, with the, you can't really see it here, but you can see the wet shaped mouth and then the round ears. And then this one here, it's got the pointed ears like the tips of a W and then the square lip. Sometimes when they're lying down, you can't see the lip, you can't see, you know, so all you can see is the ears and that's gonna tell you. And the white runner's got the double bump at the back, so it's. Got the, you know, the saddle in the middle, and then behind it, there's a ridge, and there's a little bit of a saddle behind, whereas the black rhino is straight. And of course, these, these, these backpack trails in these wilderness areas, I mean, you come across places like this, which just push, you know, there's just amazing trees, and 
There's leadwood forest, there's apple leaf forest that we've seen, jackalberries. And, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is uh, even in the middle of the day, especially on the Olifant's, on the Olifant's backpack trail, we can get up to 45, 47 degrees on a hot day. And it's always a good idea to cool off. And then, um, this was out uh, in the Timbavati, uh, in the Greater Kruger, where we do some activities there also. And, uh, you know, that's also quite beautiful areas. Um, and then this is what, um, if you, so, so what we do is you can either stay in your tents, which is cool also, or we can, we do sleep outs where uh, we have turns to stay up at night. And, uh, you know, there's a fire going and everybody has a turn. And usually I enjoy those discussions where people decide who's going to be going first. Eh? Because people, I don't know, for some reason, nobody wants to go first. But it usually goes well. And uh, we, we tell them, don't wake us up until, and we, of course, as guides, we don't uh, do that thing anymore, you know. It's not the job there. So we just ask the guys to wake us up if anything. And uh, I mean, it's a like a care story, this, you know, you can just really have a nice time with your mates and um, there's no stress here. And of course, on, on, on these activities is uh, you can get really beautiful encounters. Uh, this, this is only a part of a, what was a very big herd that came to drink. They didn't even know we were sitting right there. Um, and we just watched them come and drink, and it was, it was just. And uh, this particular picture here, we were tracking a uh, lion. So, depending on the group, sometimes uh, you know, trailing an animal is 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 a long drawn out affair. Sometimes we tracked these lions for it was you know, initially just a male lion, and it turned out to be a pride of twenty two lion in the end, when we did eventually find them. But it's hardcore tracking, guys, you know? It's reading the sign. It's losing the tracks, doing a 270, a 360, a 180, one guy that way, one guy this way. Found it, take the group there, follow it again. Uh, you think these animals walk straight, guys? They don't. They, they, as these male lions, I don't know, they just, they, they, they seem to walk like, you know, like this, in sort of a zigzag fashion. Um, and on one occasion, this, this particular group, um, we found where the male had, had caught up with the rest of the pride because we followed the trek and all of a sudden he turned and then we found where that entire pride with the cubs was lying down. And then they started walking. Um, they walked around like that back towards the Latava River. But that, then the next moment we saw, geez, the tracks are all gone. Eh? Uh, it just vanished into thin air. What had happened was they picked up a couple of buffalo bulls and they started chasing the buffalo bulls. So you could even see where when we picked up the track again, where they were chasing the buffalo and how these buffet just smashed bushes down, trees down. So it's really awesome because um, these activities, depending where you are, which day of the trail, which part of the day, where you need to get to, you can actually do this. You can actually track a buffalo if you want, elephant, rhino, lion, leopard. You can do anything that you want to hear. And of course, we, we always ask the guests if they're cool about it. Uh, sometimes people don't want to track buffalo or elephant. And, you know, we respect people's wishes. If you don't want to track a, a herd of buffalo, it's good with us. Eh? We'll just leave it. So um, it was, and of course, it was like fresh evidence. So there's nothing that smells worse than this in the bush, guys. It's a fresh <laughs> pile of lion crap. I mean, it's really, really, really awful, stinchy stuff. And when it's dark like this, it's from the meat. So there's no real bone matter in here. And it's also from the blood that turns that meat black, black, black. So I just made sure <laughs> around them. <laughs> and of course, there they were. After three, three and a half hours of trailing, we, we found them. And uh, on this occasion, this is a picture that I took because when we read the signs were so fresh, I told the other guy, I said, they're right here. Eh? And we clipped up and we just saw their bellies going up like this. They were all lying flat under that apple leaf. Flat, and then we, we were in a gully here, so we backed up on the other side. So we watched them from across like that. And then the one guess he tramped on the branch and he like, oh, you know, <laughs> and all those there just went, oh, and they looked at us and, and they just bolted. They, they ran off. 
So, so this is what we did afterwards. Uh, we just had a nice relaxing because it was hardcore trailing that. And of course, very rewarding in the end. Um, and then the guys went for a swim. So that was summed up that particular day. Lion track, which is, uh, if you look at the top picture with that Mopani leaf, just behind it is the back part of the lion track. And yeah, that was a great day out on the backpack trails. And of course, here, yeah, guys, uh, we can really get to good vantage points. This elephant, as I explained earlier, was drinking water. And uh, he'd actually dug the hole and uh, started filtering the water out, taking the dirty water. So they know exactly what to do. And then this, this is a horrible picture. But you know, when you get a wild dog on foot on the Olifant's backpack trail, it's really something. And um, this is the only picture I could get. There was about seven of them. And uh, so we got the EWT guy that even contacted me about the sighting because these are packs that are in the bush. Eh? They don't come in uh, sniff around people's cars. And, and then this is uh, taken on the Kruger Trail also, um, this random campsite there where we were camping, beautiful views. There's the Taj Mahal there, and the full moon rising in the background. And then, um, guys, the, uh, the Kruger Trail, I've, I've mentioned that word a few times. It's a new product run by the Only Rangers. And uh, it's really, and I know that Chris is very in, into this, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So it's, you walk the length of the park over three years. You do two legs a year. You start off at Pafuri in the north, and you work your way to Crocodile Bridge. So I've done a couple of these legs. I haven't done all of them because the activity is fairly new. We're into our third year. And uh, really it's sold by an auction, but I know that Chris said we'll put some information available for the guys uh, on the ESSA group if you're interested in that. But this is really an awesome thing. And uh, this is hardcore. It's, uh, it's eight days, so it's six nights in the bush on the trail. And then one night before and one night after at the starting point and at the end point. But these are, these are incredible experiences. Uh, each leg is about 100 kilometers. So you can imagine over six days, you're walking close to 20. Some, some days, you're getting lost. <laughs> um, or technology fails. But uh, yeah, this is just an awesome thing. And then, you know, one of the things that we do is, uh, you know, in, even the backpacks in Kruger, uh, the Olifants, et cetera, we do a lot of the, the planning in terms of where we're walking. We, I, mean, I mean, I don't even use the GPS anymore for this. I know exactly where I am. But for the Kruger Trail, these are uncharted areas. Um, some of these have only been walked maybe once or twice by previous groups. So we make sure I plug in all the GPS. I, um, I use a Motion X on the iPhone. Uh, on the uh, Android, it's the... Uh, is that Alpine Quest? That's the other one. It's much better than this. But everything's plugged in, and basically, I track my my route. And uh, you know, this was sort of halfway through the thing where you already walked 46 kilometers. So, because at the end we've got to submit reports, how far we walked, where we. Of course, uh, this is when you like really lost, and you like uh, show me yours, and I'll show you mine. You know, <laughs> it's like uh, no, but. So, so the idea with a lot of these things, and this is how I also learned that the trails, the walking areas, is you first walk as a backup. You learn from the senior guys, and then you map everything on your phone or your GPS. I, I've got a Garmin as well that I use. Um, I mean, I'm not afraid to use the technology because if you, I mean, why not to use it? Especially when, when you have emergencies, when you need to call choppers and things, you need to know where you are. And you need to know how to tell pilot or the doctor I am at this point here. So a lot of the preparation work gets done before. And then of course we um, we get to see some amazing areas and what this picture doesn't show well is the big overhanging rock up there. Um, I can just barely make it out. It's, uh, it's, it's the only known site in the Kruger where elephants have been painted by you know, the Bushmen. And uh, it's, it's an incredible spot, this. And uh, I was first there in 1999. We're now in 2020. And 
I've got a few pictures that I've taken over the years where we've noticed a deterioration in the painting, the quality of the painting. And this particular painting has been dated to not very long back, 350, 400 years ago. Um, but yeah, it's, there's definitely losing. So a lot of these activities also, guys, these backpacks, you can even sleep here if you wanted to, you know, uh, beneath here. I had a beautiful uh, leopard sighting at this rock. We were coming from the westerly direction and we got into the riverbed and I just saw this big thing walking in front of me, like this huge thing. And I thought, yes, it's a lion. Eh? Look, it's a, near my, it's a leopard. Eh? And it, so we got the people behind this bush and we watched this leopard as he jumped down the embankment. He walked right in front of us. And uh, you know, there are times when I wasn't so lucky. A leopard is an amazing animal in terms of the, you know, the, that sixth sense that it has. On the olifants, we even, we track it. And then you can see it's right here. And you go and find this rock and you peep over the rock and it's lying on the other side, maybe 50 meters away. Get the people there and you're like, nobody even breathe. We'll tell you when you can breathe. And once you see, you lift your heads up slowly. But when we lifted our heads, it was already looking in our direction. Our, that thing knew we were there. We, were, we thought we were quiet. And I've got a few encounters like that where leopards pick us up like this. But this particular guy was, he was, there was a couple of impala there. So he was zoning in on those impala. He wasn't worried. I mean, this guy got some amazing pictures um, and it eventually walked right up to that painting, the bottom and it spray marked at the bottom of the painting that rocked it. It walked around and it started stalking the impala, but then they picked him up and then he just walked off. So that was really, you know, those things stay with you. To see a leopard on foot is really, and I must say, uh, Andrew, when we did the Pongol with you, we saw a leopard, but it was a brief, quick, quick one, uh, yeah. And of course, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I had the pleasure of doing as well, this is just a morning walk, but it was to take my daughter on the steer. And for me, a lot of the essence, what we're trying to do with these activities is to you know, get, get the youngsters involved and to get them interested in nature guiding and wilderness experience training, where, you know. So hopefully, I don't, I don't know if she'll become a guide, but uh, yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> This was at the end of the uh, four of the Kruger Trail, which is Nwanetsi camp to um, Loosabi. It's 106 kilometers. This was just beneath the Loosabi low water bridge, you know. <laughs> we pulled quite a crowd of this because we were all drinking water from that river. And uh, it was really uh, amazing. Eh? So that's it, guys. That's it. Yes. <clears throat> Are there any questions or? Great. So first of all, Ash, <clears throat> just to say, wow, what a storyteller. <clears throat> Certainly, there were times today, tonight, when I could find, I could feel my own heart beating, as you were describing that uh, that that charging by the by the rhino, and when you described the. That, that sighting of your of your leopard, wow, man, just amazing. So we do have a couple a couple of questions uh, tonight. Let me just load up the load up the chat. Um, okay, so uh, Mariam asking, do, have you been charged by a couple of animals before? But obviously, the, couple, your your talk really covered that question well. Um, so one of the questions is, how do you deal? With high daytime temperatures, and how do you manage it with your with your with your the guys that are with you? Uh, no, that's a very good question. Uh, so one of the things that we we fight with sand parks about is that these activities, um, the lonely bull, and the pongol, they start from the first of February every year, and they run till the thirtieth of November. I've done a couple of trails in November. If you walked in the Shinwetsi area or you in Shinwetsi in November, there were, uh, it's four days, three nights, four days, four, three days. The temperature was, well, the first day it was about 40. It was okay. Then the next three days, it was 46, 46, and 47. Um, so, and guess what? We were in areas where we had to dig for water. So, so it's what I said earlier is, you, uh, in, in November, the sun rises quite early. And if we know our trip plan is to break down camp the next morning, 
we're not going to leave at eight o'clock in the morning. You get the guys up at half past four, you start walking half past five, even five o'clock. And um, you, depending where you're walking, the first thing you make sure is that people are hydrated. I always tell people that even if you're picking up a slight headache, you, you're dehydrating, you need to drink water. And you know, when you, if you're walking, say seven Ks that day, if you start at five o'clock, you can clock up seven Ks quite quickly. But by eight o'clock, it's already like 36 degrees. Eh? By half past eight, it's like 37, 38. By nine o'clock, it's like, it's unbearable, you can't walk. So we plan it in such a way that people have enough water. We plan a sit out, we sit the whole day in a spot in the shade, we're waiting for that sun to die down a bit. And then we start walking at about half past three, four. Even then it's hellish hot. But that's all you can do. We don't walk in the heat of the day. You're just gonna get people, you're gonna get yourself into trouble. Eh? Um, we've had some heat exhaustion cases where people were you know, severely uh, exposed to the heat. And the other trick about it, Chris, is that you know, we've got to keep an eye on the guests all the time, especially in hot conditions. I mean, and I, a lot of the time, uh, I myself, I'm suffering, uh, you know, I'm, because I mean, we're human, you know, we do this, but our bodies maybe get a little flu or something, and it's not hundreds. And um, I just make sure me, myself, as a guide, I'm hydrated so that I'm able to take care of a group of eight people and that make sure that everybody's okay. So we manage it within the conditions. We leave early, we make sure people have enough water and yeah, uh, nobody gets left behind. Eh? Everybody's in it and we, we have situation Sometimes people, I have you on the gas, they drink a lot of water. We share the water around. I always carry extra water for those in situations. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Awesome. Um, okay, cool. So the next one is um, from Nick. He says, I've read that some trail rangers, especially with overseas clients at private reserves, have been known to set up confrontations with animals to give the, <laughs> the clients the YouTube moments and the bang, the bang for their bucks. Any, any comment on that? Um, right in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned my, my four rules. The three is the standard rules. Stay behind the gun, listen to instructions, don't run. I've added that fourth one for this very reason. And uh, I mean, we, I'm a, you know, in the Kruger, I'm a, amongst a pool of many freelance guides and I'm not aware, and Kruger is not the private sector, but I'm not aware of any such uh, staged encounters. I think a lot of the guys, they've got serious experience and, um, you know, the, 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 the this whole activity is underpinned by respect. However, in the private sector, I can't comment. I've done a fair amount of work in the private sector. And also, I mean, I, I have read about that, but really at the end of the day, you know, we all belong to uh, a field guides association or whatever. Uh, you know, you need to have your qualifications, et cetera, sorted out. And, um, if people are staging these things, I think they're going to get caught out. Uh, I personally you know, don't know any of my colleagues who've done that. I, I don't support that type of thing. Um, I think it's, no, it's not on there. So yeah, I hope that's answered the question. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, um, Christopher was saying he did the Lonely Bull Trail in 2013 with Ash. Uh, dude, I'm very jealous Marlin, of uh, I'm not uh, sure which Christopher it is. Yeah, yeah that's me. Marvin. Hey, Chris, uh, you're awesome, man. Nice to chat to you again. <laughs> hey, how's it, Ash? Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that was an awesome trail. I can remember that. It was. Um, in particular, I remember an elephant encounter. Um, yes. I put one pick up there that shows you, Ash, with the elephant in the background. Um, yeah, I remember I, that. Uh, yeah. All I can say is that yeah, um, there were kids involved and the kids kept on coming up the gully and then running back down and not listening to mom. Yeah. And then mom managed to get herself quite worked up and gave us a bit of a mock charge. Um, yes, I've got to say, I was standing right behind Ash um, and I honestly thought I was going to see a dead person or a dead elephant at that moment. But <laughs> Ash and the guide that was with him um, reacted absolutely perfectly. They both leaped up as the elephant was charging, right in front of the elephant, literally. Um, and together they cocked their guns and told us afterwards that that very loud metallic noise is what caused the elephant to stop. 
literally skid to a halt about five meters mm. away from us. Um, things calmed down a little bit after that. There was a bit of tree pull or pulling out of trees, a bit of urinating by the matriarch. And then slowly they got the kids under control and moved off. Um, yeah, and as far as I'm concerned, that was an encounter of a lifetime. From what I've seen mm. here, that happens quite regularly for Ash. So I'd suggest that, or I, I would call this experience um, an experience of a lifetime. It really was. It was an amazing experience. I'd highly, highly recommend it to anybody who's fit and who can deal with the heat. We went at the end of October, and yeah, I do remember it was particularly hot. The heat did play a massive role. Um, Chris, did you, up, did you upload that picture, Chris? Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll upload it and I'll share it on my screen. Okay. I think oh, okay. I know. Um, yeah, yeah I, I remember that experience. I mean, that she, <laughs> she was so cross mm. with And there was this big fallen over knobthorn tree with these rocks and she couldn't actually get to us. But I mean, our trunk was like just here, you know, and she was trying to get to us and we just stood there and like, you know, <laughs> Yeah. If you disturbed your family. And I remembered that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, we were completely to blame, not the elephants. Um, but yeah, what a heart stopping moment that was. And you know, the, you know, the other thing, that was one uh, encounter that got me reading up about elephant communication because what amazed me that day was when she went back towards the rest of the herd, there was no sound that she made, but there were so many Ellie's in the reeds and they, she just started walking and they all, they all came towards and they all followed her out there. So there was definitely some ultrasonic type of communication that, uh, I mean, it was amazing to witness that. But thanks for that, eh, Chris. Yeah, no, I, I, I very clearly remember being close enough to the elephants for a long time to hear their stomachs rumbling, which apparently is a form of communication. I've just read the book, I think, uh, The Elephant Whisperer or something along those lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, it was it was quite a thing for me to be able to listen to the rumbling of the stomachs and the communication through the stomachs. Yeah. Well, wow. awesome, awesome story, guys. Uh, so I have got the file open, and I'll share I'll, I'll share it as soon as we're we're done with the questions. Um, <laughs> so, what is the the best time of the year to hike in the Kruger? Um, so because of that February, March heat of the day story, my, my recommendation to people is always to walk between uh, April and the end of August, maybe even to the middle of September, end of September. August and September is the best in terms of sightings, but the water tables are also quite low, and, but the sightings are awesome. And uh, if you got the right campsite, you're walking in the right areas, you're sure to have lots of elephant, buffalo, and hippo encounters. Yeah, so I'd say August, September. Awesome. So just as a as a heads up, and and thanks, Chris, for 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 just sharing your experience. I am really hoping to organise a hike like this sometime next year. Uh, maybe even to be part of the auction for the um, for the Kruger Trails. And uh, just keep a look, keep a look out on our um, WhatsApp page. Um, and if you are interested, just let me know off, off the list and I'll make a little, a little group together and either this one or somebody else will, will, will try and make it happen. And uh, obviously, because we know people that know people that are super cool, we'll, we'll find out when the best times are and which are the best hikes to do and so on. So yeah, just, just watch the space. Uh, I really wanted to make it happen. And if we can, we will. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that, that I think answers, Alan was just saying, how do we book one of these trails? So I'll do a bit of homework and we'll get back to you. Okay, cool. Um, a lot of people saying great talk, awesome stuff. I've had a couple of private messages saying they're loving the, loving the show. Um, are there any age restrictions of the hike or doctor's permissions needed? Hey, yes. <laughs> So the backpack trails, uh, 15 is the minimum age limit. And anyone over 65 can do it with the medical certificate. Um, so that's all three of them, the Olifants River Backpack Trail and the Pongol and the Lonely Ball. And the Kruger Trail is a different animal, guys. You know, that's also hardcore stuff. Uh, I think there is a requirement for medical certificate for over 65s, yeah. But age is nothing, as I've learned on these activities. 
I've seen some really fit people out there that put a lot of the youngsters on the trail to shame me. Eh? Yeah. They really amaze me. Those three ladies that I referred to earlier, yes, I just, I could not believe <laughs> that. Brilliant, eh? yeah. Cool. Um, any questions from the guys at the country club? Yes, I got a question. Uh, the, the length of the trails. So um, I think the Kruger Trail we covered, right? That's uh, six legs, about 100 k's a leg. The Olifants is a linear route, 47 kilometers. The long three, uh, three nights, four days. Yeah. And then the uh, Pongol and the Lonely Bull don't have set distances. Uh, we usually walk about at the most, maybe 10 a day, but averaging about seven or so, depending on the guides and what, where you want to go and what you want to do. It's a much, uh, yeah. they do products, but it's much more relaxed activity, I thought. Eh? You know? There's the olifants, it's go, 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 you know. Kruger trails, go, go, go. You get to a point there. Eh? <laughs> and then if you get uh, interrupted by a elephant or something, then, uh, you know, it, uh, you got to plan your things. Because eh? you got to get... <laughs> There's a lot of roadblocks, I should say. Last year, we, uh, I won't like if I say this to you. I mean, I, because we counted, we were stuck uh, with a herd of elephant. We were in the river, we're trying to get on the other side. And there was this pool of water there, and they were digging. And I mean, we were stuck there for about three hours. Uh, and I mean, I, sometimes you get up and you've got to force your way through. But if I say to you, we counted about uh, 700, the three hours it had come down, big herds of 80, 100, 120. I mean, I, I, there's really a lot of elephants in Kruger, guys. So, yeah. Anything? All right. Uh, um, so, I've got a question about cost here, Chris. Uh, so, so, Chris, will you guys put the information about where people can book these trails and costs? It's on the Sandparks website. Yeah. Okay, guys. So let's just with regard to any of the logistics on on these hikes. Um, give me a shout off, as we say, off list. Um, and I am doing a little bit of homework, and we'll start looking at what options, what options we've got, how the auction system works. There's a little bit of uncertainty with with that. Um, seems as though the information that I got originally uh, from one of the Sandbox guys may have, may not have been right. So I am going to do a little bit of follow up, and I will. I will post some information and yeah, if you, anybody's interested, just let me know off list and I will start creating a little community behind the scenes. Ooh. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just see, I've got one last coming through. Uh, yeah, a lot of guys saying great, great, great talk. Um, so Ash, from, yeah, from my side again, thank you so much. Um, I'm really inspired to, to do this. It's been a lifelong dream. And just watching you and hearing you has just made that that determination to make it happen even stronger. So thanks so much. Just as a as a as a inter well interesting um, at the Glenna Freak Lodge, which is around the corner from Hardapiersport Dam, they've got a couple of elephants that have been rescued, and uh, I was treated to to an elephant experience last week, and made the sound as best I could as an elephant rumbling in its stomach. And the matriarch came up to me and actually used her tongue to uh, explore my face. I was left with elephant snot everywhere and vowed not to wash for the next month. But I was told by my girlfriend that I would, unfortunately. But uh, also, what an astonishing experience. And so um, just, yeah, such amazing things to be able to connect with these animals. And really, you brought it alive, Ash. So thank you so much. So guys, if there's any, unless there's any more questions, then I think we'll call it a night for the evening. Mm. Right. Thank you. Anything from your side? No, I think Ash from, from our side, just on, on behalf of ESA, um, really um, your absolute love of the bush, but more than that, your, your respect of the, the bush, the animals and your guests just shone through in that presentation. And, uh, and, and to make it more than just a visual presentation, but some sort of emotional bond there, I think really spread through your audience. I really certainly felt it, you know. It's made me as excited as anything to join you on another one of these things. So Ash, 
We really appreciate you coming out here. We really appreciate that you're prepared to battle with all this technology. And thanks to our audience there. And as it's now become a tradition, I'm going to ask you all just to put your cameras on for three seconds. And we're going to raise our glasses and give Ash a big round of applause there for coming out. So put your mutes off and raise your glasses. And <laughs> Yes, thank you, and we will see you either on the trail or back here for one of your next adventures, which we will strong arm you. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right. Here we all are. Oh, now we can finally see Ash. <laughs> Well, come up just, with my background, I don't the... know why I thought I did it differently. <laughs> okay. Oh, hang on. What am I doing yeah. here? So, Ash, thanks again, man. That was uh, really, really, really stunning. I got to say, I totally love, love the talk. So, thank you very much. It was great. Really great. Thanks. Oh, right. Actually, it looks like you have Sorry. lost Ash already. Yeah, I know. <laughs> He's definitely gone. Yeah. And uh, all the guys that have joined us online, uh, this is our second hybrid talk. So thank you so much for coming and joining us. We really hope that you had a, had a great evening. Cool. Excellent. Thank you for organization, Chris. Uh, awesome. Yes. All right, guys, I am going to shut the talk down. And no. I did record it, so we just need to figure out how to get it online. Yeah, I'll just use Google Drive or... Well, uh, I'm actually still create a YouTube channel so that we can a, a private YouTube channel because I also got a couple of recordings. Okay, cool. So I need, and we've I obviously got the well. one from um, the four by four guy as well. So yeah, let's yeah. let's look at making that happen. So, yeah, so I think we should we should just get together and, and upload it to one one spot. All right, cool. Mm. All cool right. Stuff. Um, Excellent. Just um, right. Christopher, if you're still online, um, I just saw that you're wanting to join me. My number is on the on the list. Uh, just let me know off list, um, and I will create like a little a little WhatsApp group or what have you, and we'll make and really make um, make best we can to make something like this happen. Okay. Okay. Cool. Chris, I'll do so. Like a dude. All right, guys. Thank you so much again. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Thank Cheers. you. Ciao, ciao. Thanks. Bye. Bye.